Welcome to our virtual fireside chat. Today, we are focusing on nurses and midwives delivering prenatal and postnatal care during COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. And um, Vanessa Carey, the CEO of C Global Health, will start us off with some opening rem remarks. I am muted. Uh, so thank you, Julie, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning, especially to our esteemed panelists that are joining us from around the world, different contexts, different settings, which I think is really poignant because we are living in a moment right now where everybody is vulnerable. The problem with COVID is though, even though we are all vulnerable, what we are seeing is that those that are more vulnerable before the COVID pandemic have less access to resources, less personal agency, less opportunity to pursue the things that they need to not only survive, but to thrive, are those that are actually getting the hardest hit by COVID. And we've seen that in every country, in all settings, um, here in the United States, and one of the speakers today, you know, comes from this community. You know, we're living in Boston, right near um, Chelsea, Massachusetts, which is an area of 1.8 square miles, 40,000 people, and has one of the highest incidences of COVID in the world. And I can say from personal experience, having just been working in the hospital as part of the COVID response, a lot of our patients are coming from there. And yet at the same time, we're watching growing numbers of cases happen on the African continent where the resources are already limited, where there's already crushing burdens of HIV, TB, and malaria against which we've made tremendous progress. Where we also though have huge burdens still, unfortunately, for maternal mortality. 99% of maternal mortality is still occurring in resource limited settings around the world. And I think that with those already existing challenges, we're now layering on another in the form of COVID. And so this conversation for me today is incredibly important because it's an opportunity to really speak about how do we respond to this moment of COVID and also use it as an opportunity to not only build a COVID response, but build a response that can be lasting, enduring, and resilient beyond COVID. Because if we put the skills in place, the training, the networks, the referral bases to you know, ensure that, for example, women who are pregnant during COVID can still access extraordinary care even as they, you know, COVID is over, and that we can continue these networks and, these, and, and the investments we make today to build out a strong system for maternal child health, for primary care, then we will have leveraged this moment into an extraordinary opportunity going forward. But today is also very poignant because we're in the middle of a pandemic during this very important month where we're really celebrating the extraordinary work of nurses and midwives. And nurses and midwives have forever been on the front line of the human response and forgiving care. And I can also speak to very personal experience as a physician that my ability to do my job is impossible without the extraordinary team of nurses that I get to work with. And having just come off the COVID ward, I was watching my colleagues go in and out of rooms all the time because it's what patients needed. It was part of delivering high quality care and they were doing their jobs with amazing, amazing commitment. And I think that when we live in a world right now where you know, over half the healthcare um, in the world, close to 80% of healthcare is delivered by nurses and that nurses and midwives make up nearly half the global workforce. You know, as we're confronting COVID-19 today, nurses and midwives are gonna be on the front of the pandemic response providing continuity of services, providing dignified care for patients. And it's really through, I think, this example in this moment that we, I think we have the opportunity to really further leverage our goals of getting to universal healthcare and to really showing what a well-distributed, well-empowered um, workforce can look like, but it's going to be nurse and midwife led because it always has been. And we need to be able to really highlight that powerfully. It's a big reason that C Global Health has done the work that it's done of investing in the, in the training and building and supporting a resilient workforce in partnership with the countries where we work. Because that is based um, in part and strongly in investing in nursing and midwifery education. Because we know that not only are you already doing this incredible work, but there's a, there's a power to really ensuring that nurses and midwives also are playing a role in leadership 
and playing a role in policy setting and playing a role in ensuring that these environments are strong, robust, and providing high quality care. And so um, I'm hopeful about this moment. As dark and as scary as it is, I think we have an opportunity to elevate a conversation and to really help implement change uh, in this important moment. And as you know very well, you know, for a long, long time, nurses and midwives have been undervalued, underpaid, certainly underrepresented in policy and leadership positions and decisions, where I believe that you know, only about 25% of leadership positions in global health are occupied by women, um, and even less of those are nurses and midwives. And so um, we have, and so we, I wanna pledge to you SEED's commitment to helping to really change that and to begin to use this moment, like all moments though, to really transform um, what policy and change can look like when it's nurse-led, midwife-led, um, and we can really elevate those voices. So today's uh, webinar is part of our year-long Nurses Lead, Midwives Lead campaign that we have launched, which is um, all encompassing with a variety of different things, including helping to curate a journal totally dedicated to the voices of nurses and midwives in academic medicine, to elevating voices through webinars like this, um, I want to thank our partners with whom we are deeply committed to working with throughout this year to continuing uh, this campaign, including IntraHealth, um, the Frontline Health Workers Coalition, Partners in Health, Smile Train, G4 Alliance, the Nursing Now. Um, together, we've really been trying to think about how we can champion uh, a year-long campaign going forward. The goal of this campaign is to raise awareness and influence global policy, engage audiences across the global um, across the globe and highlighting nurses and midwives as a responsive and respective leaders in health, um, in health delivery, and to helping demand improve recognition and investment in these essential part in the you all who are essential components of the workforce and ensuring that we build multidisciplinary teams that are built on respect, dignity, and the voice of those that are leading in healthcare. So please check out our nursesandmidwiveslead.org uh, website to read inspiring stories from the front line. So that's all one word spelled out, nursesandmidwiveslead, L-E-A-D, dot org. Um, and, we are, and we're continuing to help try to elevate voices there. I do also, if I can, want to highlight some very key dates. So the International Day of the Midwife was May 5th. The International Nurses Day is May 12th. Um, Mental Health Awareness Month is the entire month of May. Never do I think in history has there been such an important time to be thinking about mental health as well at a time where I think people are struggling against huge amounts of challenge, huge amounts of um, uncertainty and unknown and great loss and mourning for a world that we used to once have and for a world that we live in today. And that's where I also wanna really again highlight wherein lies the opportunity and the chance for hope that we can change how we work, we can change who can lead, and we can change it for the better. Um, and I hold on to that every day. Um, National Nurses Week, we are, we are in it. May 6th through 12th, we wanna take every opportunity to really celebrate this week, um, especially in this COVID pandemic with everyone on the front lines. And so just a very huge and heartfelt thank you. Gratitude um, and solidarity. And then finally, just to acknowledge that it's, the US, it's in the United States, it's Mother's Day on May 10th. And I know that many of us um, who are women, who are uh, healthcare providers, who are supporting a healthcare provider, have children or have a mother, um, and that sense of connectivity and the sense of, I think, caregiving, the sense of compassion, of empathy, of um, just, patient, embracing, dignified love and sense of community that comes from all of us who understand that relationship um, or who have benefited from it is important right now. And so with that, I wanna send this back to Julie to kick off our panel and just to say thank you for being a part of this really extraordinary moment that we live in, for being on the front lines and for giving me hope for what lies ahead and for what we can do together. Great, thank you, Vanessa. Um, so again, I'm Julie Mann. I'm the Associate, Associate Midwifery Director um, at SEED Global Health, and I feel completely honored to be 
um, part of this and to introduce this amazing panel that we have. Um, we have here today Anna Grace Oma. She is Head of Clinical Nursing and Midwifery at Lira University in Uganda. We have Jennifer Nezapur, who is a nurse midwife at Mass General Hospital in Boston and Chelsea Healthcare Center in Chelsea, Massachusetts. We have Dr. Pandora Hartman, who is a midwife, um, an international midwifery consultant currently working on a project in Syria and also a clinical midwife in Atlanta, Georgia. We have Isata Dumbuya, who is Reproductive Maternal Neonatal Child Health Lead at Partners in Health in Sierra Leone. And we have Foste Wingabere, who is Senior Neonatal Care Clinical Mentor at Partners in Health in Rwanda. So we have representatives from around the world. Thank you. Um, so over the next hour or so, I'll be asking these panelists questions to explore what it's been like caring for mothers and families and babies um, on the front line of this pandemic. And we invite you all to listen, but we also invite you to participate. Um, there'll be no live questions um, that you can, um, that you can uh, request online, but, uh, you can also, but how you can submit questions is through the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. And we ask that you use the Q&A box, not the chat box. And um, at the end of our session, we'll be um, going over some of those questions that you submit. And so um, I'd like to start off um, maybe with you, Anna Grace, um, thinking about um, you know, what, what has it been like for you caring for mothers and babies in the midst of this pandemic, whether they have COVID or whether they don't? What's it been like? Thank you very much, Julie. And, uh... Thank you everyone for joining us today. I am privileged to be part of this panel and uh, I feel lucky to be here. Um, this year has been the most amazing year for us as uh, Lira University. If you, if you look at the nurses lead advert, most of the pictures of nurses and midwives are actually coming from Lira University. And I must say thank you to Sip Global Health. Um, Uganda has been, um, probably I would say a little lucky that we still have cases up to about 98 cases as per today. Uh, and um, that, has not, that has not actually exempted us from all the other effects of COVID-19. We've been on a total lockdown for a period of a month and a half uh, with um, limited movements here and there. The mothers or the women uh, turning up for care generally to the facilities have been reduced. We hope that it will get better because if the number keep reducing, then the burden of whatever is keeping them at home will increase. Um, the anxiety, everyone seems to be anxious, including the mothers who come to, to seek for care, whether they're in antenatal or they're in, the, you know, intranatal or postnatal. The women seem to be anxious for a number of reasons. Um, the infection seems uh, to have a very limited information or facts to the people out there or to the community. And so everyone is anxious. Um, most cases that come to the facilities are emergency cases or cases that need urgent help. And uh, so sometimes you don't know what aggravated um, the condition to come probably it's it's still from the anxiety or from other social aspects of the lockdown or the COVID-19 or the worries associated with the disease. And so the community generally is moving now from the panic stage. And I am worried that if we don't improve um, so fast, then we are going into another stage. And that may not be so good for 
at the maternal and child health. Um, being on the front line, I have been in the hospital for the since Uganda announced its first day of lockdown. The first few days has not been easy with us residing within the facility, and I would say it was difficult for all, including the health workers, um, the patients that come to the facility. The mothers saw a lot of uncertainties. And therefore, it becomes very complicated handling them. Whether the mother is a, a suspected case or not, she's already psychologically affected by the, the, the pandemic. And therefore, it has not been easy. But then, um, with the communication, prompt communication uh, between the midwife, um, the colleagues, midwife and mother and creating a good bond. It has made it a little lighter and every day we have something new to learn from whatever mistake we made yesterday. There's something new to learn that amidst all we need to stay protected no matter who the person is. And uh, yeah, that's what I can say about how it has been like caring for the mothers during this time. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Grace. Yeah. And, and Jennifer, I'm wondering how it is, you know, in your world in Chelsea with uh, such a high infection rate in a small town that, that rivals that of New York City. Uh, thank you, Julie. So in Chelsea, the word that comes to mind for me is overwhelming. It's definitely very, physically and emotionally exhausting every day. Um, as Dr. Carey was saying, Chelsea has the highest rate of infection in Massachusetts. And I actually have a slide to highlight that, if, if I can figure out how to use it. Yeah, so um, you can see Boston in the left-hand corner and just the general infection rate in Massachusetts. And then um, in Chelsea, this was as of April 29th, so it's actually higher now, but the rate was um, 55,217 as opposed to 865 in, out of every 100,000 in Massachusetts. Um, now the rate is actually 5,957.85, and that was as of yesterday. And then you can see um, below the just Chelsea as compared to some of the other cities. Um, one, one thing that makes us unique as a, as a city is that we have a very high um, concentration of immigrant and refugee patients. And um, many of our patients are considered essential employees. So as such, they were not able to socially distance and they're still having to go to work. A lot of our patients work in restaurants, they work in um, supermarkets, they work in public transit. Um, and we also have a lot of patients that work in healthcare in a variety of capacities as medical assistants, um, some cleaning the hospitals, cleaning the health centers. Um, and we also have a lot of mothers that work as LPNs or um, caregivers in nursing homes, which has been um, an area that's been impacted very highly. And then um, one interesting factor as, you know, also as Dr. Carey was saying, our leaders keep saying this disease doesn't discriminate, which in a way is true, but in a way, I think we're seeing that's not true, at least in the United States. It's definitely highlighting existing health disparities across the country. Um, this is just a map of Boston based on the percentage of non-white residents, and it pretty much exactly ma matches the um, higher rates of COVID infection, which is what we're seeing that our, our Black and Hispanic mothers are disproportionately impacted by this virus. And then um, this is a map of areas in Boston with high um, density of Hispanic and Latino residents. So this is um, Chelsea and East Boston. And then that actually almost exactly correlates with the numbers of um, people that are considered essential employees and that we're not able to isolate. 
So that's just some um, background data. Working at Massachusetts General Hospital, obviously we have access to remarkable resources, which is you know one of the silver linings of all of this. But I think we're all still seeing just utter devastation for some families. I had a particular case a few weeks ago, I was working in triage and we had a mother that had, a very young mother, she was 22, she came in um, through the emergency room with abdominal pain. She was contracting about every two to three minutes. She was 35 weeks pregnant. You know, we were obviously concerned for preterm labor. She was also nauseous. She'd been vomiting for a few days. She'd had diarrhea. And um, you know, when we got her on the monitors, her two sats were decent, like 95 to 96, but her heart rate was very high. And um, we eventually, you know, listening to her heart and her lungs, diagnosed her with pneumonia, got a chest x-ray, and she was in fact COVID positive and had COVID pneumonia. And as I was talking to her, she told me everyone else in her family was sick and she lived with six other people and everyone was sick except for her daughter. And she said, oh, but it's okay because my daughter's taking care of us. And she's, she's cooking, she's cleaning, she's doing the laundry, she wears a mask and she's staying healthy. And I was a little confused because her chart said she was 22 and the way she was talking about her daughter was like she was a teenager that was cooking for the husband who was very sick and you know taking care of the aunt and uncle. And I said, oh, but how old is your daughter? And she goes, well, she's seven, but she's very mature for her age. And so that's, that's what we're dealing with is you know a whole family of adults who are sick and a seven-year-old wearing a little mask taking care of her family oh, thank you for sharing that yeah i mean the ramifications of this disease is is huge and especially when the mothers fall ill um and and the burden goes to the often the children or the the female children often in some cases um what is it, Isata, what does it look like for you in Sierra Leone, the women and the babies you're caring for? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, just to give a bit of background about what's happening in Sierra Leone at the moment, we do have cases. Most of them are within three, um, the capital city and um, the rural areas around there. Although, there's some coming out into the districts. So where I am based in Sierra Leone currently in the Eastern province, we do not have any cases as yet. However, this doesn't mean that we haven't been impacted. Life has changed so much since um, March. So we, we have to be part of the lockdowns, which is really very hard in this sort of setting because you, you can't even have a total lockdown. So we have inter-district lockdowns whereby People are not allowed to cross over from one district to another. Um, and then we have three days of total lockdowns. In most cases, we've had the second one. We can't have any longer than that because in this sort of setting, people sort of earn their living today for what they're going to eat for today. So if you shut down services, you lock down everywhere, people would, they'll, they'll starve. They have no ways and means of earning to store and keep and say that we can afford to lock down for two weeks or a month, et cetera, et cetera. That would take a huge logistical nightmare to try and organize. So anytime we do three days, even at the three days, what you then have in terms of um, maternal care is that you just have the emergency cases coming in. People are very unwell or in critical situations. You don't have our usual sort of walk-in numbers. Um, someone just... I want to come in today to have a check. Now, Sierra Leone has lived through Ebola. It took a lot of trust for people to come back to hospital settings, to come back to healthcare. And where we are, we've worked very, very hard for people to see the hospital as somewhere that you can go to and get good quality care. So what we can't afford to have happen now is for people to stay away again because of COVID-19. So we, we, we do a lot of community engagement and talking and saying to them, please come, 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 especially the maternal and the neonatal mortality, because these are the ones that die the most. 
And we, we need them to keep on accessing services, not just for emergency use, but for daily checks. Come for your antenatal clinics. Um, come to, if you, if you feel that something is not quite right, please come sooner rather than later. So that is a message that we're constantly having to give. So what you then have is, and when people come for maternity purposes or even for their sick children, one person doesn't come. So you have them coming in threes and fours. <laughs> so then you have a situation whereby you want to maintain social distancing. You want people to be aware that we are in a different time. That COVID-19 is real because at the moment we're slightly removed from it. Not a lot of people have access to um, clear and concise information, international information to know what's happening out there. Yes, they use social media, but they choose to, to pick and choose the parts of social media that they will listen to. Um, so they're not really getting the, the right message in some cases. So when you're trying to say that, listen, we, we, we don't want to have one patient having five visitors here. We can't um, have this many tra this much traffic coming into the hospital and we need you to observe social distancing. Um, we've just got to the stage where everyone has to wear a mask before coming into the hospital, but they still come. So you want the patients to come. The difficulty is they're not going to come alone. They're going to have to come with people because everyone feels that I need to be there to support my relative. This is not a society where people come to hospital and you don't come with an accompaniment. And plus, you need to have visitors. So trying to get that balance of um, not shutting the hospital down, having normal services running as normally as possible and, and encouraging the um, um, pregnant women, um, new mothers, young babies, children come, come before you are seriously unwell. Don't come via an ambulance because to come via an ambulance usually means they've come from um, a, um, a village that is probably about three hours away and they're in a bad condition. So we want you to actually walk in, access your mm -hmm. um, community health hospital so that people can get the sort of preventative care rather than all the curative measures. So. It is, it is difficult, but we are prepared. We've got the, the staff trained because mm -hmm. there's also the anxiety. People remember what Ebola was like. So in as much as you want them to be aware that this is, this is a new pandemic, but it has, um, it has um, consequences that people do get well, some people do die, but we don't want them to that same sort of fact, if you like, and sort of bring it back to Ebola. Some of them are only just beginning to recover from that physically as well as mentally. So we, we um, in the sort of the psychological support, we need to sort of help and talk people through that setting as well, so that they know that, um, because before Ebola, you come to the hospital, for most of them, they think, oh, they take you to the hospital, you're not coming back. That this is not it. If you have somebody who is sick and has symptoms, please bring them because then and only then can we be able to do something with them and be able to um, monitor their, their symptoms and help rather than you keep them home, just keep on going to the hospital. The message to us to try and get out there is the hospital is open for business as usual. So that's you bring where up, yeah. Thank you. You bring up a lot of points, which we're, we are going to circle back to, but, you know, um, I think a theme throughout um, so far has been the anxiety and the um, sort of the emotions and the, um, the mental health of not only the, the workers and staff, but also the families and the patients and how that affects them seeking care and not seeking care. And, and, um, and as you mentioned, you've dealt with that with Ebola and, and are now dealing it, with it again. Um, we'll circle back to that, but I do want to hear just in general from Pandora and Foste. Um, Pandora, what, what's it like in your world um, where you're working? Well, the world is quite interesting. I mean, if we look at the, the two hats that I'm wearing, on one hand here in the Atlanta area, um, the practice that I work with, we have mostly a socioeconomically disadvantaged clientele. That's what we've always dealt with as one of the few practices that has a complete complement of midwives of color um, who are practicing, you know, in an inner city and we do water births and things like that. So as such, you know, using the hub model where you bring your kids, you bring your family, you bring everyone to the office. 
Um, the office is always double and triple booked and people like hang out, you go here and you talk and you go there and you talk. But now with having to space out visits, the office numbers have dropped tremendously. What do you mean I can't bring the kids, Miss Pandora? Uh-uh, I ain't coming to see you. So then there's that trickle down impact as well when you think of the midwifery practice and the clinicians in this also who still, you know, we often hear about the frontline health workers. They're still trying to make a living. So, you know, there's been a drop, a severe drop in the numbers um, that is quite challenging. On the intrapartum side, you're then sometimes dealing as well um, as the receiving ends of home birth challenges. Uh, you know, trying to transfer back into midwifery care where some things perhaps should not have been because there was a fear factor where women who may not have been candidates for home birth, either physically or psychologically, are now trying to home birth and you get the call and says, um, she's been in labor for two days and there's green stuff trickling. Um, can she come to you now? <gasps> yay, yay. But, you know, what are you going to do? We still are there to provide the care um, from the picture as well of the ambulances coming in through triage. So it used to be all hands on deck. The mom says, ooh, the baby's coming, I'm pushing. Well, now there was a moment where the ambo was coming in and everyone kind of looks at each other. Okay, N95, face mask, face shield, gloves, gowns. Oops, baby's on the bed. You know, so that ability to have the humanistic side and the hands on touch has been so impacted, you know, in this, like, what do you do? And so there's that constant internal struggle of just wanting to touch, you know, those hands on the belly. We do it automatically. Yet now there's all these barriers and layers and trying to connect with women just through the mask. So then on the flip side, um, in my role uh, with as mentor and director for the Syria program, it's actually from a policy level been a pulling them back because we do have a severe lack of the personal protective equipment where so many of the midwives that I'm working with are just wanting to go to the facilities regardless, you know, with little care at all for themselves. So I'm having to push them to care for themselves and then push back at the policy level so that midwives are actually counted in the numbers, you know, both midwifery clinicians and students. So we actually have the opposite problem again, where we're literally fighting the families to stay in hospital because they will come to a facility and in two hours, they want to be gone. Two hours for a vaginal delivery and four hours tops. We can convince them to stay for a cesarean section. Can you imagine? And we're talking about early post, at, and this is a no. setting where with all the internally displaced persons, forget these nice community health, telehealth visits not going to happen uh, just because of the connectivity on the one side and then telehealth on my other side there's a concern about zoom because you know the government's not going to be looking at what i'm doing in america and then on the other side there's just not the access for that to be a reality and with the severe lack of healthcare workers in northwest syria we have only to we only have 200 midwives um so there the the diver also it makes me a little bit crazy sometimes because as what we're complaining about here on the other hand what i'm dealing with is even worse and more dramatic because there is no testing um and we don't know who's positive who's not but the, with the fluidity of the borders even between iran and iraq that were open for so long we know there's a lot more cases than they're reporting yet in atlanta we don't as well have a universal testing for pregnant mums or the family. So, you know, again, there's the exposure um, as healthcare. And I think as most healthcare workers, there's a guilt. There's a joy in the guilt as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and you bring up a, a piece that I hope to circle back to is that, um, you know, that as, as midwives and nurses, we, we are healers and we, we, we value so much that connection to our patients and that touch. And it's a real struggle right now with not only with your PPE if you have it, but if, um, you know, even if you don't have it, that fear of like, should I get close to them? Um, so thank you. And, and Foste, um, wh what's happening in Rwanda in your world and specifically your care of the babies and keeping them safe and measures to protect them um, from maybe getting COVID from their mother or, um, or not and, and just after birth? Thank you very much. Yes, in Rwanda, we have been concerned with COVID since March. 
since the first case was diagnosed in our country. Then just one week after, they declare a total shutdown except uh, essential services. And among essential services, healthcare providers were among those people who have to go to work. Then no one could understand what will happen. How do we go there? How do we come back to our home? What does it mean? No one has an answer. It was just a quick team thinking about maintaining or sustaining a quality care in our neonatal units. Then we were taken from our home to our workplace. We were accommodated and we stayed there. We are not going home. We are with families and kids. We are caring. We, we were following public instruction that we put on masks to be protected and protect babies. We keep social distance, but obviously we can't keep social distance in the NICU because we are nesting baby, we are caring, we are taking IVs. So it was like, what does it mean? How can I keep a social distance while caring? So we just decide to take some protective measures to always put on masks, put on masks for mother and father because they are part of our team. They are not visitors, they pattern with us while we are caring for their newborn. Then we are always open. What is happening? What does COVID mean in neonatal units? How baby get infected? Can't vert, uh, vertical transmission happen? We are lucky that up to date we have that. It can't be vertical, though we are not carrying COVID positive cases. It's still now at national level, but we are always concerned and conscious that can happen anytime especially uh, where I am now at one of PIH site, which is really closer to Tanzania border. We are among the high infected zone. So we always anticipate that can happen that we have cases in our site, but we keep uh, saving babies. We keep being with mothers. Yes, they are anxious, yes. But when they see us having 24 hours roster, being with them, they feel comforted and they think like we master the condition though we don't master it, but we are running together. It is a team thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So a strategy that you're using for moms and babies is you're keeping them together and you are doing lots of education and teaching and just through that sort of giving them confidence about, you know, how to keep their baby safe and care for them. Yeah. yeah. What are some other strategies that uh, you are all using to, to address the anxiety and fear of the women who do seek care, whether it's you know, via emergency, um, um, uh, um, a difficult home birth that you know, then transfers in, or you know, the women who seek care in mass with their family? Um, what, are you, what are you doing to address those fears? Um, Isata, do you wanna speak a little bit to that? more, you already touched upon it a little bit, but. So what we tend to do, um, where we have people all together under the mango tree, we go out and sit mm -hmm. there and chat with them and ask them about what, what have they heard? What do they understand about COVID-19? And um, just try and engage them and unpackage it in a way that mm -hmm. they can understand at their level and then just, sort of tease them and say, right, so now that you have learned so much, you are now the ambassador for your, your village, your area, ask them like, where are you from and how many people are there? How many people are you going to go and tell what we've discussed? And even amongst those settings, have a sort of um, question and answer session to see how much of what you've actually said to them, do they understand and do they get, so that when they go out there, they can be sort of our, um, mouthpiece because we've tried to do community engagement we've gone out to all districts we cannot reach everything we're working with the community health workers so they can continue sort of engaging people at the village, village level but also it's important for the, the ones that come to us so that they they trust us and see that we are we are doing all that we can to prevent them but also that if it does happen we're already putting measures in place that we can help as well to um, care for them, but that we need them on our side because we don't want people to not come 
And if you do come, we want them to know that they're safe and that they can also be a part of this. They can go out there and be part of the message, be a messenger to go and say, this is what COVID-19 is about and this is what it, it does. And this is what we can do to help to protect ourselves. So almost education and then empowering the women to share the message and to be a teacher as well and a mentor. Um, In addition to that, you know, when we're talking about anxiety, for me, I feel like I'm being pulled back into what was like basic in nursing school, the C's, caring, compassion, um, and the art of a midwife just being there's so much more time that's spent on the phone. Oh my goodness. Um, and at like three o'clock in the morning on Saturday, I got a phone call, 3 a.m. And the woman on the end, she's literally just screaming. She's just screaming and crying and screaming and crying. And so trying to coach her through just breathing and being calm. She wasn't in labor. She was just in a, to she was having a total anxiety attack. And all I could do was put a smile in my voice and literally it, I remember looking at the phone 39 minutes later, she was still screaming and crying and screaming and crying because of the severe anxiety. And I thought, you know, this is the art of midwifery, of just being there. It's okay. You know, I'm here for you. We're together in this. You know, all of those same sorts of words that we use for comfort. So generally for the anxiety, there's just actually a lot more of that, I think. That yeah. just knowing that someone is there, that you can reach out at any time, in any place, and access someone to listen. Right. I think it's so true. And, you know, a lot of what nurses and midwives do is just create a space for people to feel what they're feeling. And that's, we've done that all along. And this is just a, a time that it's needed the most. Um, but I think along with that, I, I'm speaking personally, but also I think as a profession, it's really hard to do that um, and not drain yourself um, and your, um, your energy and your emotions and your tank um, and what you have to give. And so I'm curious as to um, how all of you are rejuvenating yourself and filling your tank and so that you can continue to give, um, because I think that's a challenge. Um, and I don't know, um, Anna, could, do you want to speak a little bit to that about what you're doing to, to sort of fill your own needs and continue to give? It's, it's hard to talk about because it's, it's really challenging, but, um, with everyone around you, with colleagues, um, I remember the first few days we would have an evening of just sit and chat, a few of us, as the others take up a shift and you know you are taking a little break. And then you chat through and you're like thinking loud, but with someone you can share with. And this is usually uh, common when you have colleagues of different caliber. Let's say you have an obstetrician around, you have midwives, and then you share something that you commonly you understand. And then if you, if you feel energy drain, it's good to just take a break, let someone else uh, take up the duty and you, you rest a little bit because then you'll be the next patient. Uh, the other thing is having a midwife who's pregnant and she has to work. Mm. Remember she already is scared that, you know, being pregnant, you're vulnerable and you are in the front line, you don't know whether you're next. And sometimes I, I remember when I, I called the midwife and she answered me on the phone uh, crying. And she says, why do you put me in such a situation? I said, you know, you don't have to come to work, just come so that we can share, you know, and have you know, some thinking together. You think better when you're more than one. Other than being at home, you might actually be in more panic at home than when you with your colleagues. And those are some of the things that have pushed us through. Otherwise, the thinking of COVID-19 alone is not fun. So sharing your stories with others, colleagues, and, and sort of relying on them and building a community within your colleagues to lean on. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer, what about for you? 
For me, I've been trying similar to what Anna was saying, um, relying on colleagues and coworkers and definitely recognizing that we're all in this vulnerable space together. I think um, another thing that helps me is to find something every day that takes my mind off of COVID. I feel like the last few months, it's, it's really been all COVID all the time, you know, to the point where sometimes you're, you're just thinking, oh, I would love to just have a visit focused on breastfeeding or, you know, the usual things. Let's talk about contraception. And then the patient brings it back to COVID and you're like, but you're IUD. Um, so even, even taking half an hour every night when I go home to do something where like, I personally love to run. And so that's something that I've been able to do still, um, not, not currently, but usually, or, um, you know, talk to family, talk to friends, play a game over FaceTime with my siblings, something that gets you focused, not on COVID, I found that very helpful. And I try to remember that, you know, it is in a way about perspective. I, um, previously to becoming a midwife, I served in the Peace Corps and our country director would always tell us that like, you know, in any situation that's very intense, like Peace Corps, I think midwifery is also similar. You see the worst parts of humanity and you see the best parts but you can choose which ones you want to focus on and which ones you want to remember. And so for me, that's, that's always stuck out to me that I can, I can choose to focus on the good moments instead of the bad ones and to remember those moments. Speaking of good moments, um, you know, this, this is, this is heavy, all of this and challenging, but I know there are some, stories of like great joy and and happiness amidst these um you know, would one of you like to share one of them um or have one of them to share i just want to share with you that though we are within the middle of the pandemic we still have our joy in NICU we still have baby who are recovering and going home Though we are running to smile inside the mask, but we're still smiling. Right. Then, <laughs> yeah. Then we feel comforted. And as when we think that we are not alone, it is a global challenge. It is a global thinking. It is a global team thinking together. We feel like, oh, we are lucky to be in the front line. And when we remember that this day, here dedicated to nurses and the midwives, then we say probably they have seen that COVID will be coming in our period. Then we'll be in the front line and fighting and getting things better. Asta, you bring up a great point is that there are moments of joy and we are lucky to witness birth every day, um, which in and of itself is often a joyous occasion. But, you know, with masks on, we often have to tell people we're smiling because they yeah. can't see it. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else want to share a story that brought them joy during this time? I mentioned the mum who had rang screaming, right? So in the course of the next 24 hours, she rang about three other times having a severe trauma. Um, as I got to know her a wee bit, she talked about 18 years ago having been pregnant, and this was the day of the anniversary of that particular pregnancy. And so she's pregnant now and she wasn't in labor. So she went on to tell the story of uh, all of us as midwives, nobody wants a shoulder dystocia, right? So she had had a severe shoulder dystocia, right brachial plexus injury, arm was broken, years of therapy for the now this 18 mm. year old child. And so this was an accidental pregnancy that she didn't want. Um, whoa, so this is really, really heavy. She went on to go in labor and I went in for her. Um, and so we went on to deliver. It was a beautiful delivery, low key shower, lights off, aromatherapy, like the whole idealized package, right? Um, and delivered on her hands and knees, a little girl. And the mom was there, the mom who had had nothing but prior C-sections, had never seen anything like this for C-sections. And to be there with them and the whole family just healing and crying and being allowed to bear witness 
to this tremendous moment of joy. You know, we had six of the family members on FaceTime and I thought, wow, it's possible. You know, despite all of that, and even with the mask ladies, we can still smile with our eyes, you know, put those cheeks up high, that we do what we do because it's in our hearts. Um, and bearing witness, we, we are privileged. We're truly privileged. So there are those moments of joy. Take them. And I just say, keep doing what we're doing. Yeah. Thank you. I could, I could go on and ask many, many, many questions that I have, but I think we're going to move on to some of our, um, our, our audience's questions. We have a lot that they've typed in. And I just want to make sure that we address them um, as they listen to us. And one of the the questions that has come up a couple times, um, you know, we've talked a lot about masks and our PPE and some places have more than others in terms of PPE, but um, are, someone's curious as if we, um, are you reusing them? Um, and, or what is your policy or, or how are you getting by with maybe limited PPE? What are your strategies? Um, Asata, do you wanna to talk to that? Yeah, <laughs> our strategies, um, we do not have enough because um, first off, some of the supply that we, that the Ministry of Health and Sanitation did have got burnt down um, last year, July, in a fire that burnt down the entire under five building. So most of the PPEs were stored behind there. So what we do have currently is the remaining stock that P um, PIH currently has which is not enough. So it means everybody cannot have a, um, a mask, a new mask every day or for every patient, et cetera, et cetera. So we are having to reuse them. Um, our director of nursing, Vicky Reed, is in charge of that. So she makes sure that you will use it and you get one in. Kasata's connection gave out a little bit. Um, hopefully it will come back in. But um, Anna Grace, do you want to talk about what you're doing in Uganda for um, PPE and the resources you have? Yeah. Um, thank you, Julie. I would say it's, it's one of the biggest challenges so far we've had with uh, the number going out every day. But uh, we've, we've resorted to making um, a locally made mask from within, uh, reusable, that you can clean, iron, or you know, boil, and then reuse it again. It's, it's easier and you know you can easily access it when you need it. Um, we've also resorted to you know, getting a plastic apron that is easily available in the market. You can easily buy one and use, and if it's wearing out, it's cheaper, so you can replace. Um, in the event that the facility cannot provide it in time, you prefer your protection is paramount, and therefore you get one for yourself. You, know, you make sure you keep safe. Other than waiting from the facility and then you don't get protected, it's, it's not, it's not not good at all. So that, that has been our strategy locally. And when you say you're making them, are they made of cloth? Yes, made of cloth, double layered. Double layered. Yeah. I think, thank you. And I think we have Asata back. Asata, do you want to continue? Okay, sorry about that. This is the internet connection here. Sure. So. So these are the surgical masks that we use, but you have to put them over the cloth masks. Um, so at least that way, the um, surgical mask looks, it stays cleaner for a bit longer, and then you can always take off the cloth mask, wash those out. They are double-layered. Some for people who have to do direct patient care, it is not enough protection. So you still have to have a surgical mask in there. and. Um, we still have an issue what about the patients. So the patients themselves are currently now being asked to come in with a mask on, unless if it's obviously an emergency via the ambulance. So we would love to be able to, for every staff member to have full PPE whenever they're caring for patients. But the reality is we just don't have them. We, we, are, we don't know yet when we're gonna have a next shipment of supplies in. 
So we have to make sure that what we do have in store is enough to last. And as I said, at the moment, we haven't any patients. So we, if we start using up everything for every, um, everybody who comes in, what happens when we do have sick patients coming in, when we do have positive cases, we would have nothing then. So we just have to be really economical with what we do have in stock. It's a, it's a it hard... Is, um, it is. Yeah. It's frightening for, for the staff as well because they read, they know, they hear, and they're like, you are asking us to continue caring for patients, same as usual, but we haven't got the protection that we think we would need. And then right in the midst of that, you will just see someone walking around in full kit, full gear, and you're just like, ah, where did you get that from? <laughs> we, we're struggling and thinking, how am I going to get this for somebody to go into a high-risk area? And there you are with um, full shield, mask, the whole works, and a gown. Like, you need to come and take that off and give that to us now. But this yeah. is... Um, a game of two halves right now. <laughs> I think we've all felt that. I see all the panelists nodding. <laughs> um, and, and that gets to another question here is specifically, um, and Anna Grace mentioned a little bit of this, someone's curious as how do you protect frontline nurses and midwives who are pregnant? Has anyone dealt with that or um, seen that? And Grace, I you mentioned speak to that a little oh, bit. Sure, Jennifer. Yeah. I mean, so we as a hospital have the policy that after 37 weeks, they don't have to work anymore. I feel like that still creates a lot of anxiety before that 37 weeks. But, um, you know, in general, we're just trying to protect people with PPE as best as possible and cover for your coworkers if you have a coworker who's pregnant maybe say okay i can go do the swab or i you know i can take the covid positive patient obviously some people are more willing to do that than others but i think in general most midwives and nurses will step up and and help out someone who might be pregnant and recognize that it is a time of increased anxiety and worry yeah. Someone else is interested in knowing if we've seen um, uh, an increase in premature births due to COVID. Foste, have you noticed this in Rwanda? Oh, you're muted. Let's. We had had an impression that we could have more home deliveries and preterm labor, but it is not really different to other months. And we had been coming to mothers with preterm babies and asking to see if they are really anxious or having trouble with COVID as a trigger to their labor, but it wasn't. It wasn't really. In our community, it seems like uh, when they say total shutdown, some people are thinking like, oh, probably hospital will close. And some people were flashing back in their moment of 1994 in the genocide against Tutsi, those who had order enough to know. And people were afraid, but they were very like when they say the morning that the sun is rising, the um, uh, local readers are sensitizing them to really report when they need to access healthcare when they have a need. Then they come, they see us on roster, they see the number, they see the, the support as usual. Mother will feel, oh, probably COVID uh, is not directly our game because we still have our healthcare workers with us. We still have access to healthcare. And we were lucky that the Rwanda has managed to really control the spread of COVID-19. We don't have those cases in communities. So they feel like they are protected enough. But our impression in the UNETO unit was that probably we'll be having many babies born home, a root, preterm because of COVID. But actually, we don't see much. Yeah. I haven't seen that. Has anyone else? Um, does anyone else want to speak to that? 
So it doesn't seem like that's the case in, at the moment, but time will tell, I guess. Um, another question from our audience. Um, one of the measures of controlling COVID-19 is social distancing, isolation, and this can have such a negative impact on supporting mothers coming in in labor. Um, how are you promoting respect, respectful maternity care services to the mothers coming in? Pandora, I see you smiling. Would you, what would you like to say on that? Peter, it doesn't change. That's what I'm gonna say. Um, I think a, a picture can be worth a thousand words in this case. Let's see if this works. Um, there we go. Uh, when we talk about respectful maternity care, this, this is a picture of our, our midwives um, here in Syria. And you see, they're still trying to do some of the social distancing with the covering. But when it comes to the actual time with the mother, there's still sort of that hands-on care. You might be doing it for more of a stretch. But, you know, just I encourage everyone to think about all the components you know that come with respectful maternity care it's just as much about being there and offering informed choices and making sure that the families you know are partners in their care and that they are all educate you know and offering choices even though it might not be that we're able to offer the full range of choices but still offering some choices so that underneath rmc we're thinking about empowerment right and lack of infringement of human rights and so you know getting them all of those things we can still do um as midwives and nurses at every level i think and even pushing more at the policy level as well to make sure that the rules and regulations that are being put in you know of the fear of COVID, you know and contracting infection that they aren't going to negatively impact the moms you know with in terms of companions and all of those things as well so it is possible it just requires a little bit of rethinking of how we are um, providing that care I know there's been a lot of talk around, um, you know, a support person or accompaniment um, of a woman in labor. Um, is everyone still currently allowing some accompaniment in labor? Um, Asata, you mentioned something about this that even if you tried to put restrictions, it's not it, it's not working. <laughs> not working. So in our case, um, accompaniment is something that's taken as a given in our setting. So to, to try to stop that, we probably end up with women then making a choice of staying home. Then um, if I can't have my family member around me, if I can't have somebody who is constantly there just for me, um, they know that the nurses and midwives, we are there to offer care and um, companionship and support and be with them as well as offer the clinical care, but they, they do want to have a family member there somebody that is their own, that belongs to them. So we understand the importance of that. And we, our issue is just trying to restrict the numbers. One woman really doesn't need seven supporting partners. This is, in this particular setting, it is not right. So it's about trying to reduce who needs to come and be with her, who can stay around these people, when you tell them leave, they will shuffle out of the maternity unit, but then be outside, and they will sleep under the tree, they will sleep under the stars, just so that when that woman asks to to see someone, so you can go out there and say, and someone will for her. So this is something that we we need to continue to do as it is part of this part of um, midwifery care. This is not nursing care. Somebody, our patients, our clients still need to know that there is somebody out there for them. And it's important that we maintain that, but at the same time, manage the numbers um, a bit better. I'm curious, the, um, the support person or people, are they making their own masks and wearing masks? Yep, they are. So everyone's making their own masks. It's a kind of compulsory to have a mask on before you come into the hospital. It's really interesting. Some of the masks that you do see, some of the masks you like, you should probably not even bother having this one on now, but um, <laughs> everyone is making an effort to have some sort of um, facial covering before, before coming into the hospital. 
And some come in with it and then promptly take it off and you think, okay, this totally defeats the purpose. It is not sort of a pass to get you into the hospital, but it's something that we would really appreciate if you keep on. And others, you feel like I should probably give you another mask because what you have on there is not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. <laughs> we need to just keep on pushing with that to say at least have some sort of covering on when you're, when you're within the hospital um, grounds. And one, I think this will be our last question, and I think it's a great one to wrap up with. Um, someone in the audience says, um, asks, how do you celebrate your COVID-19 victories? Um, maybe you can each just, whether it's personally or as a team, um, maybe you can each just say how you sort of celebrated a moment. Um, Jennifer, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I actually feel like there's been a lot of virtual celebration and a lot of phone calls. I actually just had a phone call a few days ago with a mom who has been either COVID positive or under investigation, it feels like for two months because everyone in her family was positive and then a housemate was positive and then she herself was positive. And um, she actually, she's postpartum now finally got her negative test and her husband's also negative and so we just had a, like a really big celebration over the phone or we chatting and you know and she got to go home to her newborn finally and just her and her husband had been in a hotel and it was it was just a very joyful tearful celebration and she's sending me pictures of the baby and just to share that moment with her was really awesome great thank you and Pandora, do you have a COVID-19 victory moment? Well, there was a victory moment on Monday um, when we realized by pushing the, the cluster, we were able to get PPE for all the student midwives to go back to clinical next week. So that's a win for us for Syria. And with that beautiful birth, um, binge watching Queen Sono on Netflix, all good. Six hours of girl power, spies, even little things to <laughs> refill, celebrate. Great. Personal self-care, love it, yeah. And Anna Grace, what about you? What's a, a moment of victory for you? Um, I think it's, most of it is really virtual. It's not really, you really can't have a gathering, you know, show the joy, but have a few phone calls and have to celebrate it with others. Yeah, connecting, connecting in some way, virtual mainly. Yeah. And Foste. What about you? You have a moment of victory that you felt like, ah, we're going to make this happen. We're going to get through this. Hello? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, we are on positive side with the national efforts to control the pandemic. Now, numbers are going down. Uh, after 45, uh, 45 days of total shutdown, now provinces live have started. It is just a uh, interprovince lockdown. We are seeing that we are moving to the sun side. Then we are hoping that we are in the good side and we are controlling the pandemic, but still anticipating and preparing for any case. If it happened. Thank you. And Asata, what about you? So we have um, three guest house where most of the clinicians 